talking to Joshua Starnes, who is the president of the Houston Film Critics Association. We're going to be talking about Star Wars, the film that hopefully everybody has heard of before. Joshua, let me ask you the first question. Do you think this is the movie that the mo- that's been watched the most times in the history of ever, I guess, in the movies? It's going to be pretty close. You know, there's maybe a couple of other really, really big ones that have been around slightly longer, something like Gone with the Wind or or uh, Sound of Music, or, you know, there's odd ones that get put on TV all the time, like Wizard of Oz that they show every year, and, and It's a Wonderful Life. But uh, it's hard to say, but it's got as good a shot as one, any one of those just from the sheer number of people who love it. I, I think that I think it's been viewed the most times because all the fanboys watch it like 100 million times, including yourself. But I think that the unique visitors, maybe it's. The, I think there's a debate. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's for me, there. For me, there's definitely no, no debate. I just the, the movie I've seen more times than just about any other. Do you know how many times you've seen the movie? I've lost. Got to be in the thousands. I, I've lost track at this point. You've seen this movie like over a thousand times. So you can do you now think now you this is now over just in perspective over the course of thirty some odd years? Yeah, well, we're in the same generation, so we grew up with with Star Wars. So I've seen it a, a bunch of times as well. But can you recite the film from like beginning to end? Probably, I've never tried, but certainly at any given point while watching it, I know exactly what line's going to come up to the point of the cadence, the expected cadence, and uh, the pitch and the tone. So if I I tried, I probably could. All right, so we're going to go through the, the, the six movies, and I'm sure the, the lead up to the, the, the anticipated seventh movie, but I'm sure you have a lot of, you know, a lot of history of Star Wars. Oh, you have no idea. Okay, I have no idea. So basically, I'll, I'll just throw something out here. So I, like, I just like doing the studying. I, like, sci-fi at the time, in 1977, was, it's a huge genre now, but it wasn't really a big genre that it is back then. So this was kind of a risky film for the studios, I guess, back then, right? Right. I mean, they, most sci-fi would be considered still what we would call B-movie, and, and it was from the time when they first really started making movies out of that genre in the late 40s and early 50s up through the 70s. You would have The Odd the odd Man Out, like Forbidden Planet, or uh, 2001, where a real, you know, a lot of resources were put into it. But for the most part, it was considered, you know, it'd be what we might consider something like Paranormal Activity or the Saw films right now, where they're going to put a small to moderate amount. They know they're going to make X number of dollars, so they'll make a, uh, they'll put a small to moderate amount of money into it because they have a pretty good expectation of what they would have gotten out of it. You know, the big sci-fi movies at that time that was making money was uh, like you know, Mega Man and yeah. Planet of the Apes. So what do you think, like, of all their research, why did this movie, besides the quality of the film, like, it's, must, it's usually a perfect storm of many things why something becomes so iconic. Like, what was the reasoning for this film to be so iconic during the time? There's a lot of things. You know, it's the ultimate escapist entertainment, and it was the ultimate escapist entertainment coming at a time uh, after, you know, a very, very hard time. We have po- both the post-Vietnam era yeah. and the, uh, economic, the economic troubles of the 70s as the entire era went into stagflation. You had uh, low wages, high prices, very high energy prices. So the real world, living in the real world, wasn't always the wasn't the happiest the happiest part of the happiest era, and uh, something that would give you a real escape from it would be uh, would be really really worthwhile. And a lot of movies, even you know, there were a lot of great movies made in the 70s, but they weren't really uh, up until then they weren't really super escapist. Um, but ultimately, I think it comes down to the fact that it's probably the most entertaining movie ever made. Sure, it's, it's, there's no question about the the entertainment value, but it's also like it's interesting that you bring up like it's very it's the squash bubbling, the black and whiteness of it, like the hero and the villain, and you know back you know you had an impeachment of a, of a president, the hero element in the in the United States probably wasn't, or even around the world wasn't as high as the morality. Like you're saying morality wasn't as high as it was back in the day. I guess. Well, not so much morality, just more the um, people were had been living in a gray. It would might have felt they were living in a gray, bleak world where where every things things were crumbling and the world was falling apart. And so, for something to come back and say, uh, no, it it can be black and white, and the good guys will win, and they're really good, even though they have problems, they're basically really good, and they can win. Would be a message that people would would want at that time. And certainly, a lot of the you know Lucas himself has come back and said a lot of stuff, especially the Vietnam War and Richard Nixon were big impacts on on shaping backstory of the film and what he was thinking about when he was writing all three of them. So he was just thinking about more of more of like a 
of like that like World War Two kind of concept where it's like there's there's definite good guys, there's definite bad guys, and and people are more responsive to the, that type of uh, feeling, I guess. Where Vietnam was very obviously very gray, and you know even the Cold War, I guess, was kind of black and white, but it was still kind of not as not as simple as Star Wars Something was. More gray and not as simple. And yeah. Explain because in a way it wasn't a real war. And I, it was a mixture of that, and I think a mixture of, of elements in Lucas' own career, where he had before that he'd made two movies that were much more ambiguous and very great, THX 1138 and American Graffiti. And uh, and even though you know American Graffiti in particular was a real success, they were still they were much more ambiguous movies. They were much, they were much grayer movies, and he was having um, a hard time getting his next movie made because that's what he was actually drawn to. And he he starts to make statements of, well, you, anybody can make a success. All you have to do is make a, a movie. Pets a puppy and yeah. like it, and 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 to some extent, Star Wars came from that for him trying to prove that you know if you make a movie like this where the good guys are good and they're by and they're battling evil and they win, people will like it, and he was right. It's because because his mentor was Francis Ford Coppola, who kind of had a dark kind of edge to him. He made you know two iconic movies, the Godfather movies, which were you know about bad guys kind of like being good guys, I guess in a sense, right? And no, but it's just interesting that, and then there, like, there's like, there's like, there's been so much documentation about that. Like, kind of like Coppola wasn't happy about this film, I guess. He, he, he apparently he, he doesn't like any of them except for Revenge of the Sith. It's the only one Coppola's ever kind of responded to. He, he spent, which is interesting because he came, you know, some several years later he came and he directed Captain EO with <laughs> for Lucas for for Disney World. But he didn't really, you know, it, it wasn't his cup of tea, and he was kind of like, you know, George, why are you? And and he wasn't the only one saying that. He was kind of like George. But it's the, the whole like uh, I think the most impressive thing about Star Wars was Lucas is uh, either was either luck foresight or whatever you want to call it, but his foresight uh, to get to own forty percent of the merchandising sales. Which do you think that was just? Do you think that was his business savvy, or just he just got a little lucky? I think it was both. I think you know he had the opportunity. He was having his fights with the studio, and he had the opportunity to say obviously they didn't feel they did not feel uh, strongly enough about the movie that there would be long-term success for it, so they were willing to put the uh, the merchandising rights and the ownership rights on the table if they were like those were essentially worthless compared with his director fee, uh, which compared in to today's dollars wasn't very high. I think it was something like $250,000, uh, you know, which is a good bargain on his side, and he obviously felt uh, strong enough going, you know, I believe in my movie, I will take that, uh, and, I'll, and uh, it probably helped him putting some money back, helped him finish the movie because it did go slightly over budget from what they originally budgeted. I think it was originally budgeted at $10 million and ended up coming in right around 12 And uh, so they so that helped as well. But, you know, he he believed in his movie, like all artists do, uh, but probably in his wildest dreams he could not have, have guessed that those rights, that the movie itself and those rights would turn into what it turned into. Probably no one could have. In the, the time they, like, Star Wars, like, it's people think that he had the foresight of, like, of, of coming up with, like, Episode Four, The New Hope, but that really wasn't, they didn't really do that until 1981 when it came out, like, on, when the home video sales started coming out, and then he had the foresight to do that. Well, but, yes and no. Um, so, actually labeling it with an episode of the front, they didn't do, I mean, they made, there's, the original script is not too far different from what ended up turning into the original first three movies. Um, they, they're, you can, especially if you, you know, uh, they go to, uh, instead of going to the Death Star, they go to the Imperial City, which is basically Cloud City. Um, the end of the movie is split between the attack on the Death Star, which we see at the end of the first uh, of the Hope, and the attack on the bunker on the Wookiee planet, which is what we get at the end of, um, of Return of the Jedi. So it, it's all there, uh, obviously, I, somewhere, you know, quick, or at least in the first draft, by the time they get to the point of, you know, this is how much money we're going to have to make it, and this is what we can physically do. They had to, you know, okay, so this is what I'm going to take out. He took out more or less the best parts of, of those three things, set the rest aside, probably thinking he would never get back to it, and uh, put it and squashed it into and called it Star Wars. And like everyone starting a franchise for the first time, you know, you don't say this is, you know, hopefully they'll learn the lessons. They, you know, you don't say, well, this is part one of X, and especially yeah. You say you just put out the best thing. You don't assume that there's going to be a sequel. You just put out everything. And then once you knew there was going to be a sequel, you can make, I was like, all right, so I'm going to take the rest of this stuff that I have uh, with the Emperor showing up, who did, I think in the first draft, the Emperor does show up somewhere towards the end of, of the last act. Um, you know, we're going to 
going to take a lot of this, and, and I'm going to put it back. And it, there's still a lot of, you know, a, a lot of work had to be done to it to turn it into a coherent story. But the actual truth, I mean, we we say that, you know, he was there's, you know, the idea that he was he planned it all out beforehand, and there's the idea that he that that's a lie, and that he was really just making it up as he went along. The reality is kind of in between both of those points of view. Yeah, I I understand what you're saying. Like he had like he he wrote like a, a gigantic script. And then he just like found the best parts in the middle, and basically, and then of course, it's almost like what they did with uh, Indiana Jones, where they came up with the idea, and then they basically the, the things that were scrapped in the in the original Raiders of the Lost Ark, they they brought in Temple of the Doom. Yeah, where they, yeah. they couldn't find room for like yeah. jump out of the airplane with the raft, which was originally for Raiders of the Lost Ark, and then there was just nowhere to do it. Yeah, and that happens a lot. Even sure, and and more so now because of movies like Star Wars. Generally, when they start making these, while they're writing the script, they're also simultaneously designing the big action elements, and then you just and, and it becomes a matter of kind of fitting the plot around them. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, which probably makes a lot of people cringe, but that's just the way you know that's that's today's world, right? So that's yeah, how it works. It, it works. It probably doesn't work as often as it doesn't work, but it, it does work. I mean, even the really good movies like that that we like, like Avengers, are basically written that way. Yeah. And it all comes back to Star Wars, which interestingly wasn't written that way. You know, he didn't develop the action sequences and the story around it. He sort of, the story sort of developed organically in one big jumble and then was refined down. And uh, and as far as I can tell, even of, as, from from my research, even the various most of the various sequels have been more or less written that way as well. They're, some elements get added in after the fact where they have an idea for an action sequence after they've shot other stuff, but um, it's sort of, uh, the series as a whole is sort of, despite starting the, uh, what we would call the trend of the big event film, uh, avoids a lot of the, a lot of what has become standard about making the big event film. It did when it was created, and to some extent it still does. Is this the most influential film in, like, history? Like, is this, like, in terms of, like, changing the landscape? It, it's certainly one of them. You know, it's hard to say compared to some of the stuff that's come before uh, because of just of the length of film history, but certainly of modern of modern films. We wouldn't have the kinds of big-budget action movies that we have, big-budget event films we have now, and the kinds of movies that Hollywood makes that keep Hollywood running, that keep money coming in, wouldn't be getting made if it wasn't for Star Wars. You know, you know the every... The summer film is entirely because of Star Wars. Some people say Jaws, but I say really it's because of Star Wars. Yeah, it's like it's almost like the second Jaws kind of like paved away, and then and then Star Wars drove down the car. Yeah. Yeah. Jaws was the first one that did it, but it's a horror movie. It's a genre, it's a genre movie. It's possible, you know, you, that you couldn't have figured out that it's about you know putting up these big visuals and these big moments. And you might not have been able to figure it out unless you got something like Star Wars, where it became very obvious that this is going to draw in a certain age group and uh, who uh, maybe they realized that maybe they didn't would eventually become almost the only age group that goes to movies on a regular basis. But we're going to talk, obviously, in the, in the future Star Wars podcast, we'll talk, we're going to be talking a lot about George Lucas, but right now, what do you, what's his legacy? Because like, he's got a very polarizing legacy, but what do you think is, when he dies, what do you think his legacy will be? Oh, it depends on who writes it. You know, if, sure. If, if there's, when it comes to fans and when it comes to people who, you know, there there will be, it's kind of like the legacy of maybe, uh, of any polarizing figure where you have the meme, which is the, the story that's been repeated about them so often, it is taken for granted without ever being analyzed as to whether it's true or not, and then there's the fact, so you'll have, you will have the, the what you call the pop culture legacy of, of George Lucas is that, well, he was a lucky director, but he had like one good idea, but every, but you know, Every good thing that was about his movies was made by someone else trying to keep him from screwing his own movies up, which is does, isn't really accurate, but it's easy. It is easy to repeat, and people repeat it so much that they they grow to believe it. And then you'll probably have the the more what you'd call the more academic legacy that, um, uh, as a filmmaker, what he brought visually and has stayed visually in film. Um, the the Maybe he didn't intend it this way, but he kind of how he ushered in both the end of the of the uh, auteur movie of the '70s and the creation of the big budget film. Yeah, um, and that'll probably be his enduring legacy more so than any individual film that he actually made. Even though he actually is 
despite not getting it, uh, props for it, a quite talented filmmaker who has been nominated for Best Director twice. People forget that. For what? Star for for what? Star Wars and American Graffiti. Okay. No, it, like, and also, too, you can't forget that this is a man who, in terms of CGI, like, in terms of just, like, what was learnt, taught on that film, and, like, especially sound design, like, there's, you know, he paved the way in terms of... It's a mixture of a yeah. lot of things. It's sound design, it's editing, and the speed of editing, and how fast you can you can put images together, and people will still be able to follow your story, how fast you can spend out, you can throw out plot points, and uh, people will still follow your story. Uh, the use of certain uh, of certain story elements, you know, most no- well known is the hero's journey, and the use of that as a basis for any for a three act structure. Sure. Um, the use of uh, visual effects, I'm not just say CGI, but that's that's the modern version. Of yeah. Okay. Visual effects to create that, and how well they can create some, they can create a uh, a fake world, which at that time hadn't been done very often and the results were, were somewhat mixed. You know, a couple of really, really expensive movies like 2001 and to a lesser extent Forbidden Planet had tried it and, and done a, a good job but none of them had shown the re- and he showed, you know, to the business people that you can, that by doing so and doing so well uh, you can reap a, a very large return on investment which of course means you're going to get more movies like that. Yeah, and to, to, like, like you said, like any great invention is kind of like a, a ma- amalgamation of, of uh of many like many events, like he didn't have, you know, he had he had a certain he had a sparkling of a of an idea, a sparkling of an invention, and then of course he he ran with it when when need be, so to speak, I guess, right? Like he exactly. he saw the opportunity, like and, you know, you should you should never diminish someone, like you could argue that he had one great idea, but no, but he executed it and yeah, ex- yeah. there's at least three yeah. or four really good ideas. I, I think particularly on the edited side. He and Lucas being an editor first and foremost, and being most comfortable in the editing bay, he doesn't get as much recognition for that as he deserves, since it was other people who got the Oscar. As his name isn't on the, the film as an editor. Yeah. But uh, the editing, uh, when it comes to actual film story and how you communicate a film story to an audience, which is you know one of the most important parts of filmmaking, but it's also one of the most invisible, and you don't really think about it unless you're someone who's actually in the craft doing it. But this is someone who grew up, who came of age with among the best editors uh, of the business. He, you know, his first two movies were edited by, by Walter Murch. He and Walter Murch were, uh, were colleagues together and students together at uh, USC. Yeah. Uh, you know, and he came in you know, with that group of editors at, uh, at Zoe Trope that were figuring out new ways to uh, put information together visually and by sound you know, in order to, and then created a lot of techniques that culminated in things like The Godfather and eventually Apocalypse Now, which George Lucas was, was scheduled to direct at one point in time before going off to make Star Wars. Uh, so, you know, there's a lot there. There's It's the the stuff that's on the surface, you know, the, the way the story's done and then visually the way it's told, particularly with the effects, is what's immediately taken from it. Uh, the use of a musical score, he brought that back. It had been largely diminished partly by his own efforts, because he was also one of the first people in American Graffiti to uh, use a pop culture score yeah. for a film, and he made that, and that was a huge success, and it started to get replicated a lot, and, and the orchestral score started to get reduced because of it, and then in Star Wars, he sort of brought the orchestral score back and showed that you know that in and of itself can be, can be and should be a major element in a film. Uh, the use of well, especially the in that genre and that kind of epic kind of storytelling, yeah. yeah. Yeah, like it's sort of like it fits to that because it's like it's a fantasy world. So then, of course, that kind of music fits into the sa- fantasy world, right? And originally, that was a big battle. A lot of these executives wanted him to use a pop score for Star Wars the way he did for American Graffiti. They, they thought they would be able to make money on the um, on the album, the soundtrack album sales, and didn't think that, that would happen with an, an orchestral score. Yeah, it's like let's. Do you know a lot, a lot about like how he? His team, like he brought it, like this, like extraordinary, like amount of young people onto that Star Wars film. About, like you're talking about the editors, and you're talking about some of the visual effects artists. Like, weren't they all like like geniuses from like MIT or something like that? And they just uh, no, a lot of them yeah. were a lot of them were, were film students. Okay. Also from USC and UCLA, they they were they they were much more on the technical side. They were you know guys, they were electricians and visitors, but they were they were film students. They had because you have to know how a camera works, how sure. Light the lens and exactly what that's going to look like. Um, they had been working in a new part of the field that was, you know, he didn't and he did not invent motion control.
control in modern in modern um, uh, uh, visual effects. He just had the foresight to put it to bigger use. Than it had been. They were working in commercials. He had a lot of guys who were setting up shops who were trying to find money and trying to explain to people what it could be done, and no one was really understanding yet. He was one of the first people to understand it. A lot of that was the help of his um, of his producer Gary Kurtz, and they put their heads together and, and they went out. Uh, and found a lot of people that they had known uh, before who were doing similar things. The main guy they found, who is um, considered, you know, like, who one of the fathers of visual effects, was John Dykstra, who uh, who was had been teaching a lot. Of, he was slightly older, and he had been teaching a lot of these guys who were learning these new uh, these new visual effects techniques and trying to set up his own shop. And by finding him, they're like, you know, John, this is what we want to do, and and uh, and we think it can be done. We know that there's new stuff going on. He was like, yes, it can be done. I know the guys that can do it. And they brought, and he and, and Dykstra, and to a large degree, put together the initial shop that we would call IOM, uh, Industrial Light and Magic, by yeah. guys who became, who, be, who eventually became, you know, legends and uh, visual effects in their own, like Richard Edlund and Phil Tepet and, uh, and uh, Dennis Murin. And, um, and, you know, there was a plus and a negative. It took a long time to actually get Done. They weren't there. They took up. They only had by the time they only had uh, like six months before release. They they had one shot. Uh, in the end, um, uh, John Dykstra ended up getting fired, and they brought in another man named John Steers from England, who was a long time um, miniature effects photographer. He had uh, who had been uh, uh, who had been uh, working on James Bond movies a little bit on 2001. Had had John Dykstra and brought to him. And it should be John Dykstra, I think, really good should get a lot of the credit. He was a real visionary. He came up. He worked for Douglas Trumbull. He worked for Douglas Trumbull, who uh, was the head of visual effects for 2001, who, uh, uh, and for a lot of the really good-looking science fiction, it must be said, good-looking science, other science fiction films of the 70s, like yeah. Hunters of the Third Kind and uh, Silent Running. So John Dyser worked for him, learned from him, and then went off on his own to do the similar thing, but try to do it his way. And uh, that philosophy, even though he, he um, was fired before um, Star Wars, the first Star Wars was actually wrapped and was finished under somebody else's guidance. That philosophy um, stayed there in the in the hands of uh, the young men he brought with him, Dennis Miller, Bill Tippett, Richard Edwards, who formed the basis of Island and were the and Ken Rolfe, who formed the basis of Industrial Light Magic for uh, the first ten or fifteen years. Now, I think fifteen years it existed before they went all off. But it's uh, but the thing with the, what sped up all this is that Lucas like needed like he couldn't get the shots done and like in like well, what he, he knew what they should look like yeah he knew that uh, the ways that those kinds of shots especially um, uh, miniature shots of uh, spaceships against black against, against actually you know black backgrounds with white lights in them on wires he knew that would not look like what, because what he wanted to look like was war footage, aerial war footage from World War II. And he knew that the classic method of filming spaceships in miniature would not do that. It was just physically not capable. They didn't do, even do tests of that. They knew physically that would not happen. And so they started from the beginning, from pre-production. They were like, no, we're, we're, this is what it's going to look like. I know it's possible to do that. I don't know exactly how, but I know it's possible. I know you guys know how. And they said, yes, we know how. You know, it's going to be tough but we know we can do it. And they stuck to their guns, even though, you know, it went for a long time, because um, they spend, had to spend most of their time actually building the actual machinery to do it with, because nothing existed. They, they built it all, almost all of it from scratch, and uh, it took a long time before they could actually show anybody. And so there was a great, there was probably more confidence on the visual effects guy side than Lucas as it got closer and closer to release, and they didn't have any, any yeah. finished shots, both Lucas and his producer, Gary Hertz, um, by all accounts, started to get very nervous, but the visual effects guys did stick to their guns and said, "Yes, we can definitely do this. It's going to be difficult, but we can do it." It, but it, it, like it was like, but it, it were supposed, I guess it was supposed to be released at Christmas time, two thousand nineteen seventy six, and then they they pushed it to May. They pushed it up six months, right? Yeah. But that's kind of a common thing. But it, the thing about like Lucas, it's like kind of like a, a like, kind of like a life analogy where. You know, this guy, he, he had to go to the hospital, like, he, out of, for stress, he, you know, he, this was a, this was, like, almost lost, like, a, it was a huge risk for him, it could have cost him his career as well, right, like, if it was a bomb? If it had succeeded, it would have been the end of his career, he might have been bankrupt, because he 
turned in. And, you know, he had a little bit of money for writing the script, but he basically given his entire director's fee yeah. back to uh, back to the, to, to the studio. He spent. Uh, he ended up spending a good amount of the money that he did make on American Graffiti to set up ILM out of his own pocket, or set up large portions of ILM out of his own pocket, and then to move uh, a lot of the editing uh, of the film up to San Francisco, where he could edit it in quiet. Originally, Star Wars was edited by a different individual than he's credited for. He did the first cut, which uh, Lucas hated. He routinely hated. He fired that editor. He took uh, post-production, except for the visual effects, which were still being done in Van Nuys. He took all the rest of post-production up to uh, up to uh, um, San Francisco, so he can kind of edit it in peace. He hired yeah. people, including his wife, and then uh, two of his wife's colleagues that she'd worked with on other films. Who uh, and then they all worked together and created the new what I was talking about earlier, the, the kind of new um, visual uh, terminology that uh, had been completely lacking in the first pace of the. All often joked that uh, Lucas's only direction in the movie was faster and more intense. That yeah. In large portions, his only direction, which is, you know, people say that's all he's capable of, but it's actually quite exactly the opposite of his first film. If, you, if anyone's ever watched THX 1138, so obviously he's capable of more than that, but that was basically the same direction he was giving to the editors. He was going against everything he'd ever done and any kind of editing he had done up until that point on his own student films and, and the previous films he'd directed as a feature film director. Yeah. And, uh, so obviously he had some idea. It's going to work. He had definitely had, I mean, there's definitely a vision. Definitely yeah, I was going to say, that's the key word. But there was that he definitely yeah. had a vision that he was sticking to, regardless of how much grief he got from the studio and from some of the, the technicians working for him who didn't really understand what he was making. From the shooting of it, when you had people seeing what he was building and what people were wearing and what they were saying up to the visual effects, you know, nobody could really picture it except for him. Yeah, and that's yeah. He was, that's that's yeah. He yeah, he definitely had. He stuck to his guns, and before he like a hundred percent. So that you have no matter if you like the film, dislike the film, whatever. You got to admire that his his gumption or his confidence or just his creativity of like of like sticking to his guns and and knowing what he wanted what he wanted. That's you have to admire that no matter what you think of the man. All right. Before we leave you, wouldn't you like? Because uh, you are, I argued with you that we we're, we're do, we're do, we'll do all six films. But you argued to me that I should watch the first film, like, or sorry, the 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 in its order, the Phantom Menace first, right? That's how I watched them now. Yeah, but then, but at the same time, it's like if you watch Star Wars. Now, I always I argued with I disagree with you because I, I think it should be in order of when like of uh, obviously of of when when it came out because. Star Wars now does it like it does it stand the test of time? Like do kids still watch, like like the film? Like an eight year old kid? I don't know if you have nieces, nephews, like uh, uh, kid. And I think it does. There now, there, there, it has definitely the first one has definitely aged. Yeah. Than any of the others. Part of that's because it has the, is the budget differential. All of the other movies were made are about as expensive as a movie could cost at the time they were made. Sure. That help, and that does help make your movie look quite a bit better. I mean, it's also, it's the oldest, um, it was the cheapest to be made, um, I think, and, and it was the first, so some of the techniques that they'd even refined by the time they made Empire Strikes Back were really in their infancy. Um, so when I have seen younger, eventually people do grow to love it, but when I've seen younger kids, seven or eight, they're still interested, but especially if they've grown up watching the post-Star Wars stuff, like the Clone Wars cartoon, you know, if they've sure to some other more, mo or, or the the prequels, if they've been exposed to some other more modern form of Star Wars, it can seem quaint. Uh, but in general, I think it holds up. I think that uh, that actually in a lot of ways uh, the special editions helped with that, uh, particularly in the last act, uh, because probably the, the, the only major portion that, while it has aged more than the others for the most part, just on its own, it, it would still hold up except for some of the visual effects in the last act, particularly when they start to attack the Death Star, and there was lots of stuff that, had, when they made it, they couldn't do. That. But do you agree with the thing? Like, do you agree, do you agree with them? I don't. I, I kind of disagree with it. I kind of have a problem with it about them, like trying to re remaster it every five years or so and add certain things. And like, I don't like that. I like like my original. I, I it's not my movie. It's his movie. I enjoy it. Yeah. Uh, you know, you don't have to like it. No, but you know what? At the same, like what they show you, but you know, 
I disagree with what you just said, though. I, I think, no, it's not his movie. It's actually, as soon as you're finished the movie and you give it to the world, it's not your movie anymore. Totally wrong. That's totally wrong. It's always your movie. No. I, listen, I've made movies before. They're not, they're not my movies. No, they're all they're my movies. I've made movies, too. They're all they're my movies. Nobody can tell me what to do with my movie. You can tell me if you don't like it or not, and that's fine, but if I'm going to change it, I'm going to change it. still my movie. Uh, it, it, it's it's you know, just like if somebody writes a novel... It's always their novel. Somebody paints a painting. It's always their painting. Now the world can have, it, and the individuals can have their reaction to what the person's doing. But you know, if somebody wants to go, and, and if the original artist says, "My, you know, I am having second thoughts. I want to change this one piece. It's his work." No, no, no. I'll, g I'll give you a perfect example. You brought up paintings, right? So say someone does a painting. Say you say you make a painting and you sell it, and then it goes in someone's home, right? You're going to come back and knock on the door and go, you know what? I don't like the shade of green in that. I want to change the shade of green. Yeah, but assume that, the, that he didn't that he didn't sell it. That it's you know yeah he hasn't transferred you know he hasn't transferred actual ownership. That's still his. That he has lent it to a gallery. Uh, and it's, he still owns it, but people can come into the art to the gal to the art yeah. museum and watch and see it. And then after it's been hanging there 15 years, he comes back and says, "You know, I'm going to change it. You can still keep hanging in your gallery, but I'm going to change how I painted the sun." Yes, you can do that. Let's we'll, we'll, let's agree to disagree. And the, the last point of the question I'll ask I you. I can't follow that at all. I know people say that. I think it just comes to no. A listen, like I I I because we can we we'll, we'll, we'll this is we'll we'll talk off the air anyways. Basically, uh, last question. When, when was like when was the first uh, time you watched this film? Do you remember where you were? How old you were? Yeah, uh, I was four, and I actually saw A New Hope second. Uh, the first movie, or, or I didn't see it second, but my memory is seeing it second. Yeah. My my uh, the first movie I remember seeing, actually, and, and one of my earliest living memories is of going to see The Empire Strikes Back, which came out when I was four years old. Okay. And, uh, now my parents tell me they had actually taken me to see A New Hope. Um, before that, but I don't remember it anymore. Uh, so I remember <laughs> being taken, and, and I, I told them this, so after we saw Empire, because they were asking me questions, and I was like, I don't remember what you're talking about. There was a movie before this? What are you talking about? Yeah. So uh, so some about six months later, cause at that period of time in the early 80s, people don't remember this. They yeah. They release movies all the time. I mean, Star Wars got re-released like every summer for almost 10 years, you know, in, in, in a regular theatrical release. I didn't even know that. Okay. They don't do that anymore. Well, because people can watch it on TV. On yeah, them, yeah. Watch, yeah, exactly. You can watch it. Everything makes its money in its first week. You know, I mean, Star Wars made its gross over the course of about, the, uh, of the, the number that we think of, that huge number, it made that over the course of about three years, not in, not in one three-month period in the summer. We just, that, it was a different time. You know, there were less screens. You had to go to it more often. So, um, you know, that summer, Empire Strikes Back came out, and then uh, about three months later, it was the time for the annual, <laughs> the annual re-release of Star Wars. So I was probably about four and a half years old, and I went to see it. Okay, and you remember the whole experience, and yep. and you knew that yeah. this this movie, you loved this movie. I knew I loved it. I knew it felt familiar. So it was even after I realized after they, I, I still don't have a memory of it, of having seen it, but I but having but the first time I watched it, it felt like I was seeing it for the second time. I still remember going to see with me, my brother, and my father going to see it, going walking down to the local theater uh, in near our house, and going to see it, and then coming back, and him, you know, trying to remind to remind us what it was, and uh, and until I actually saw it, I didn't remember it. But it sticks. It doesn't stick in my mind quite as clearly as the Empire Strikes Back. Sure. But that was the first thing I can actually. Remember. What was the f what was the last time you saw the movie? Uh, about three two weeks ago. And what was the context of you? Why did you watch the movie two weeks ago? Uh, I watched all. I, I well, I had some vacation time over uh, Thanksgiving. I uh, showed my one-year-old son for the second time because he's because I've already showed it to him once. When yeah. He was a couple months old. I showed my one-year-old son all six movies in in one go. About once a year, I watch all six movies. And your one-year-old son has the has the the, comp, the 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 concentration level to watch all of them. He he will watch pieces and do something else and come back. And he is definitely actually. Uh, We'll focus more on the prequels because they're more colorful and those big bright colors attract sure. than the um, than the earlier ones. Particularly Star Wars. Star Wars is probably the least colorful. The sand, yeah, the sand. The sand. Yeah. Once you know the Death Star, it's very black and white. Yeah. Whereas the other ones are very very colorful. But uh, he he also didn't watch them for about ten minutes. He was really entranced with Episode One with Jar Jar in particular. <laughs> Well, that's kind of funny, but anyways, who's like speaking of Jar Jar, which is your son's favorite character? Who's your favorite Star Wars character? Last question. 
Luke Skywalker, you really? Because I'm I'm a Han Solo guy, so I guess everybody's a Han Solo guy. So yeah. That's good. All right. So you got. All right. So Empire Strikes Back is next. Thank you very much for the Star Wars talk.